Good morning. Please turn with me in your Bibles to John 15. Yes, John 15. I know we've started Colossians, but we're going to be in John 15 today. And I'm going to read 17 verses. So stick with me through this. We're going to listen to Jesus answering some questions of his disciples. This is the last evening of his time on earth before he is arrested and wrongfully condemned and brutally killed on a cross by the cooperative work of the Romans and the Jewish leadership. And so this teaching is here to tell the people this is how you're going to live your life. John 15, starting in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Verse 7. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you needing you. We, we need your life. We need your vitality. We need your truth. We need your fruit. Lord, we, we come to you needing you. And so today, may you strengthen us. May you grow us and build us, teaching us to rely on you and to count ourselves as loved by you. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. The world is changing. How's the Christian supposed to act in a world that's changing? The rules are changing. The laws are changing. The culture is changing and everything's changing. And I don't know if you're wondering, how's this Christianity thing supposed to play out in 21st century America? We sometimes find it hard to have a simple conversation with someone. We find that we offend quite easily with words that you used to be able to use. Um, But for some reason you can't anymore because they are microaggressions, whatever that is, which I don't know if you've heard that term, but that's something on college campuses, microaggressions. You've injured me by the words that you use to describe me, like he or him, right? By the way, if we're going to call that an aggression, it makes the girl who was actually raped not really that big of a deal. Because if the word hurts you, it must be on par with that rape, right? Actually, no, it's different. It's, there's a huge difference there. And so we as Christians are stuck wondering what life is going to look like. You know, the, the Christian church has been asking that from the beginning. What's life supposed to look like? How are we supposed to do things? Now, in Colossians, uh, hi, I just saw you. It's so nice to have you here with us today. How are you doing? Oh. Who are you talking to? 
I've already embarrassed you, so sorry. We have an old friend among us, and she had a health concern that took her away from us for a while. But um, I'm not going to introduce you right now. But I am going to segue into a reality that this church has. We are good at loving one another. But we need to grow in it. And one of the ways that we grow is by caring for one another. And so when we see somebody go through something hard and we get to see that face again, it's a joy to, to see people come through things and, and be with us still. And I know that even now there are people here in this congregation, recent surgeries, recent diagnoses. And just to cut to the point in Jesus' message with the, uh, the disciples, we who are the people of God love one another. We are together and we endure life together and we love one another. So <laughs> we're, that was the end of the sermon, so let's pray. <laughs> okay, actually, the, the Colossian church was wondering, how do you live this Christian life? And, and so Paul opens Colossians with a prayer, and it has two parts. He thanks God for the fruit that was being born in their lives. They were loving one another, so he thanks God for that. And then he turns, and the second half of his prayer is a request. The request is that there would be more fruit. So he thanks God for the existing fruit, and then he prays for more. And he even prays for some specific stuff about how that fruit is going to come about. So today, we're going to go to John 15 to see what this whole fruit thing is about. That's why we're in John 15 and not in Colossians. But where the Colossians were wondering, how is this life supposed to play out? Did you know the disciples were wondering the same thing? In, in John 15 especially, Jesus is going to deal with them because they were thinking about, how am I going to follow my Lord? And they were thinking in tangible terms. He's here with us. And so he's going to command us, and then we're going to go do these tangible things. It was all tangible terminology. Later on, a couple of decades later, the Colossian church was stuck with, Jesus has already ascended and he's not here. And yet they were looking for as tangible a thing as they could find. And what they were turning to was a mysticism. Mysticism is this idea that I was hearing voices and seeing visions, and it was all just mysticism craziness. Right? And they were combining with it what's called asceticism. They were doing things to their bodies to try to prove that th this is the way that, that Christians are supposed to do things. What the Colossians were seeking was a tangible expression of their relationship with God. The disciples that Jesus is dealing with here were also thinking in tangible terms. Jesus is physically with us. But what Jesus is going to teach them here at the end of John is, I'm leaving. You're eventually going to go where I'm going, but for now I'm leaving. And they were wrestling with, how's this life supposed to play out? So here we have two examples, the Colossians and the disciples, both seeking a tangible expression to their relationship with God. And the answer to both is, it's not tangible, it's spiritual. And it's a spirituality that's based on the word of God that's complete and finished and in our hands. And yet even today we seek those tangible expressions. We want to see the miracles and we want to hear the prophecies and we want to see angel feathers floating down during our worship services. We want to, we want to say things like God is with us in the, and he's revealing his presence and we feel that he's among us. And that's actually not the answer that Jesus was giving. The answer he was giving is abiding. He's going to answer it with the, the look at the vine. Now, to be fair, there's actually a couple answers that, that Jesus gives. How are you supposed to go live this life? Answer one, the Holy Spirit is going to be given to you. And how do we get that? Because we didn't read anything about the Spirit here in John 15. That's okay. From John 13 through John 17 is all one message. It's all the last night. It goes from the, the last supper into the high priestly prayer. And right after that, they go into the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus is arrested. So 13 to 17 is Jesus' final message to him. And the big answer that he gives them in all of that is, I'm sending the Holy Spirit. 
He's going to comfort you and he's going to guide you and he's going to teach you and he's going to bring remembrance to you of the things that I've taught you. The big answer in the farewell discourse, that's what it's called, is the giving of the Holy Spirit. And yet, that's not quite tangible enough. We want to feel it. We want to see it. We want to hear it. Well, John 3, speaking of the Spirit, Using the word wind, the wind blows wherever it wants, and we don't know where it's going. The Spirit is going to do things, and you're not going to see it. You're not going to tangibly feel it. You're not going to physically hear it. And yet the promise is, He is at work. And yet the second answer that He's going to give these discouraged disciples is a, a discussion of what's called their union with Christ. Now, keep in mind, let's see if we can get into the shoes of these disciples. They were born around the year zero, or one, because there is no zero. And they've been taught from a young age, what we're waiting for is the Messiah. And when he comes, he's going to make all things right. We're, we're waiting on the, the Messiah. We're going to rely on him, and he's going to govern the people, and everything's going to become good. If you want to know what life is like, you sit and you physically see him. And you physically hear him. Their hope was based on the presence of Messiah. And yet Jesus keeps telling him, them things like John 13, 33. Which is just a few verses before where we're at here. John 13, 33. Oh yeah. <laughs> There's actually seven times in the farewell discourse where Jesus says this. But look at 33. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, and you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Is there despair in that question? We've been waiting for you for 400 years. And you're leaving. Where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now. Well, how am I supposed to live this life if you're leaving and I can't follow you? But you will follow afterward. Verse 37, Peter said to him, Lord, I'll follow you no matter where you go. I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus said, will you, do, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. Peter's need for this tangible, physical presence of the Messiah is actually going to be his downfall. Peter has to remove this idea of a physical, tangible presence of Messiah and realize he's got something better than that. And the answer comes to us in chapter 15. But realize, and taste this if you can, the disciples are discouraged by what Jesus has been saying. He's going to die. He's going to be betrayed, apparently, because that's what they got taught in chapter 13. He's going to leave us. Uh, later on, Jesus tells them, or actually, uh, chapter 14, he tells them, You know the way. To where I'm going. And they're going, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? And what was his answer? I am the way, the truth, and the life. They were still thinking about this in, in <laughs> tangible terms. Now, to be fair, if, if you're reading John and you're thinking, I don't understand what he's talking about. Right? For me personally, I think like Paul. We can move from point A to point B to point C to point D. And that nice straight line is easy to follow. John isn't point A to point B to point C to point D. He runs around in circles. Okay? He runs around in circles and he comes back to the same idea over and over and over until he burrows his way down to the point. Right? That makes John super hard to follow. And if you're thinking, this all sounds like figurative language. If that's what you're thinking, you're right on the money. John 20, or 16, 25. I've said th these things to you in figurative speech. 26-25, if you, the first line that you should underline in your path to being a theologian. I've spoken these things to you in figures of speech. It's hard to read the book of John. 
It's hard. If you've been discouraged by reading John, it's because he's speaking in figurative language. And so, what's one of the figures that he's going to use? The vine. The vine. This, there's a, there's a something, there's a connection that all believers have with Jesus. There's a, there's a picture there of, of our dependence on him and our need for him. There's actually four illustrations that the New Testament uses to, des- to try to describe this union we have with Christ. We have, we have the building illustration where Christ is the foundation and we're all the stones built on it. Right? We, we were resting on him. He's the foundation. We have the vineyard where, all the, where our fruitfulness comes from our connection with Christ. We have the marriage where we have this intimate, personal, permanent relationship with our groom who is Christ. And then, of course, the one that wraps them all together is the body illustration. We're all connected to the body. And and he is our head and we follow him. But but note here in John 15, Jesus is still answering a specific question. How is your life supposed to play out? What is the fruit of your life supposed to look like and where does it come from? You who are thinking in tangible terms, let me bring you into a picture. And so... John 15, the first two verses tell a very quick parable. Okay? John 15, 1 and 2. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. There's the parable. Two verses. Okay? The rest of this is John circling back around to describe how vineyards work. Right? This is how vineyards work. That's that's what he's saying. But catch this. The use of the vine or vineyard illustration is an old one. Turn with me to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6 is where... So we're going to go to Isaiah 5. Isaiah 6 is where God takes Isaiah and says, I'm going to send you out to accuse Israel of sin. What's he going to accuse them of? Chapter 5 tells us, here's the big problem that, uh, that the people of Israel had. And this is a song. It's a wonderful song, and we don't know the beat. So for Sunday school, I didn't sing that song. And for church service, I'm not going to sing this one either. So you'll have to hum it in your head. Isaiah 5, starting in verse 1. Let me sing a song for my beloved. My love song concerning his vineyard. This is Isaiah singing about... God's wonderful vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes. But it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard than what, I had, uh, than what I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I tell you, what will I do to my vineyard? I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. And it shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds, and they shall rain, rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are its pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. This is the vineyard of the Lord. It's Israel. He put them in the land and he protected them. God himself was its protective wall. And and he gave them the commands by which they should function. And then he looked to see, are they living that way? And so he peered into the vineyard. And what did he see? He didn't see fruitful good grapes. He found this wild grape is like a bitter grape or even a poisonous grape. I don't want that. I'm going to tear down the wall and I'm going to let the wild animals devour this. 
I'm going to invite enemies to come in and destroy this. Now, the picture of the vineyard changes when you get to chapter 27, I think is where it is. We're not going to turn there. And in that picture, it's a promise of the future. And God said, this vineyard now is so beautiful, I wish there were briars growing in it. I wish I had something to fight against. If there were briars, I would gather my army and we would attack those briars. Eventually, this vineyard is going to be so good, the vine dresser is going to be bored. Where is that vineyard going to come from? John 15, 1 tells us Jesus is the true vine. The past wild vine of Israel has been devoured and destroyed. And Jesus is the true Israel, the true vine. If they want to see what life is supposed to be like, they need to turn to Jesus, not the nation of Israel. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Now, the verses 3 through 6 are just explanatory statements of what happens in vineyards. Now, it's unfortunate we try to read John like we read Paul. In Paul, every verse is weighty and pregnant with meaning. In John, he's going to give three verses in a row that basically say the same thing. And all he's doing is he's describing how vineyards work. If there's a branch, you prune it and let it do well. And if there's a broken off one, you throw it away. Okay? This is not a defense for people who were Christians and then lost their salvation and got burned in hell. Okay? That's not the picture. The picture is vineyards. If there's a branch that's good, it grows fruit. If there's a branch that got rubbed on and broken off, you throw it in the fire. That's how vineyards work. Okay? The intent of this is to look at the fruitfulness, not defend the idea that people can lose their salvation. That's, that's not the purpose of what we're getting at here. Which, by the way, if you're looking at the rules for interpreting a parable, parables always have one purpose. One purpose. You find that purpose. You don't start talking about it from all these other things and try to, well, what, what's leaves? What are leaves? I know we're talking about fruit, but what are the leaves like? <laughs> Okay, that, that's not the purpose of the illustration. The purpose of the illustration is to talk about where fruit comes from. If a branch is connected to the vine, it grows fruit. If it's not connected to the vine, it doesn't grow fruit. That's as far as the illustration is intended to go. Okay, so we're going to skip verse 3, but we'll get back to it. Verse 4, this word abide, is this, it means to stay or to remain. It's this idea that the branch is connected to the vine. Okay, so abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. You, you catch that picture? If there's, a, if there's a branch that you want to grow fruit on it, it's got to be connected to the main source of the energy. It has to be connected to the plant, which is called the vine. Everybody understands this one. Verse 5, I'm the vine and you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. He just said the same thing again. Everybody catch that? Branches that are attached bear fruit. Branches that aren't attached don't bear fruit. Verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch that withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown in the fire, and burned. Now, some of your translations for gathered up or taken up might, might translate that lifted up. And, and your footnote might even say something to the effect of Christians that are maybe not walking with the Lord or like a branch that's down in the mud and they need lifted up and washed off and tied to the trestle. Okay, If that's the case, chapter or verse 6 isn't going to make sense because those branches that are gathered up are going to be burned in the fire. Oh, I thought we just tied it to the trestle. So, so follow the illustration. You know what happens in vineyards? People walk by the branches, hook them on their sleeves, and they break off. What are you going to do with a branch that's no longer connected? You're going to burn it. right? You're still going to notice, though, that there's branches still connected. What would you expect from a branch that's connected to the vine? Fruit. Okay? So those verses are, th are just there to tell us this is how vineyards work. Now, you want to know about you, look at verse 3 and realize the word prune and the word clean are the same word. For you to prune your vineyard is to clean it. 
So for him to say here, you're already clean, he's saying, I've already been pruning you. Verse 3, already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So to answer this first issue, these verses are here to explain to us, if you're a Christian, you're attached to the vine. Let me say that again. If you're a Christian, you are attached to the vine. We, we've done ourselves a disservice by coming up with this category of Christians who don't act like it. We, we call them carnal Christians or backslidden. Okay, whatever. Christians are attached to the vine. I, I want to be as clear as I can on that. Right? That's why you are safe for eternity because you're attached to Christ. That's why you get saved because you're attached to Christ. Sanctified, made holy, Turn from sin, judgment, or uh, justified, um, forgiven, glory. All of it is based on this idea that you are in Christ. Right? Anytime you see in your New Testament that, that phrase, in Christ or in Him, it's talking about the fact that all believers are attached to Christ. Okay? You here today may have been told that you can do something and somehow detach yourself. That is a lie and it will only bring you discouragement. And we're left wandering around in this world wondering, how do I get reattached again? No. All believers are attached to Christ. All believers. So here's, think about these disciples. They're thinking tangible connection to Jesus. And Jesus is going, if you're a believer, you're already attached. Stop looking for more. You're already attached. In fact, because of the words I've spoken to you, I've already begun to prune you. What is he telling them? You're already bearing fruit. You're already bearing fruit. So if, if there's going to be an application that we get out of this, he's still telling them, abide in me. How do you obey, abide in me, when you already are? Is it possible to more abide? Right? You look at all these other uh, pictures. Uh, the, the, the building picture where Jesus is the foundation and, and we are the, the, the rocks that are built on him. Okay, more be founded. You can't. You just are. Right? What about the marriage illustration? The, Christ, uh, the church is the bride and Jesus is the groom. Okay, be more married to, to Jesus. You can't. It's just you are or you aren't. So for Jesus here to say, abide in me, he's not saying start abiding. He's saying oh, recognize your abiding. Understand your abiding. Have an attitude that realizes I'm attached to Jesus. I don't have to rely on my own strength. I can totally rely on him. And if I want to know if I am, I just have to look around. And you know what I'm going to see? I'm going to see 15... Folks out this door doing firewood on a Saturday morning. You know what that is? Fruit. Fruit. Loving one another. The fruit of people who are connected with Christ, abiding with Christ. The fruit of that is the love of the community. Yesterday morning we saw fruit from those who are abiding in Christ. Okay? If you're still of the belief that it's possible for you to stop abiding... You need to latch on to this idea. You are always connected to Christ if you ever were. Now, if you're not abiding in Christ, the solution is salvation. You need to give your life to Christ. You need to trust him for salvation. Amen. He took your sin on the cross and he bought you with that blood and he's made you his own. You need to believe that and salvation will be yours and you will begin abiding. But... If you're already saved, you are abiding already. So the command to abide in Christ is actually build an awareness of the union you already have with Christ. You need a new awareness of your union. Hey, you, you want to think of something specific? Imagine opening up your Bible and as you're reading it, you're realizing God's promises are true because of my union with Christ. What about, what about the, the, the promises, the warnings, the blessings? All of those are mine in Christ. Right? For, for, for Jesus to say, 
of, of, all that are, of all them that are given to me, I let none slip through my fingers. It's because they're attached to him. They are absolutely his. We just need to be aware of that reality. So some, something, something to practice. How about every morning, just remind yourself of that fact, right? Here's a plug for coffee cup theology, right? Get a coffee cup that says, in Christ, right? And know what that means, okay? In Christ, you are in Christ. You are connected to him, right? But, the, but his story continues on. Verse 7 gives us this word thing again. You remember what pruned them in the first place? You're already clean because of the word I spoke to you. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Oh, we've made a slight turn in this conversation. What we realize is that all believers abide and therefore all believers bear fruit. But what's, the, what's going on in somebody who's asking God for more fruit? They're, they're recognizing in their life that there's actually things that I'm gifted to do. I'm, I have opportunities in my life. I have relationships. God has placed me in, in certain areas. And you begin to recognize there's potential for more fruit here. And so what do you do? You make requests of God. So this statement here, ask whatever you will, okay? Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. That's not talking about Ferraris, just, just so you know. That's talking about asking God for more fruit, right? We see not only is there a, a, um, a, an organic connection, a productive nature in our relationship with Christ, there's actually a cooperative nature in our relationship with Christ. He and I are working together. Could you imagine what it would be like to finally realize, I see where my king is going. I'm going to prepare for that path. Right? We got to do this uh, last, last year, beginning of this, beginning of this past year. We knew there was a, a couple in Mexico who needed a house built. We knew that if we were to build that house, that would be loving for them. What did we do? We started preparing. We started raising money and getting guys going, and there was paperwork and planning and all that kind of stuff. We prepared for a cooperative effort of loving that family. Right? That's, that's what we're getting at here. And, and guess what? God has a desire for that. Verse 8. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. And so prove to me my, my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Recognize. Again, this is not a command to start abiding in his love. It's a command to recognize that you're abiding in his love. So, so if, if, we're, if we're talking about this, this, this is the point where I have to uh, deviate from the conversation for just a couple of minutes. The Sunday school class that I taught this morning got this part of the message. And so stay with me. Don't, don't fall asleep or anything. When we have the commands of a king, for the people to hear those commands, they shouldn't be hearing those as the standard by which they'll be judged. We should be hearing them as definitions of who they will be. So when God gave the Ten Commandments to Israel, he wasn't giving them the standard by which they'd be judged. He was giving them the definition of their culture. Now, granted, if they disobey that, they're still going to be judged. That's still there. But they're the people who live this way. They are the people who honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. They are the people whose children honor their father and mother. They are the people who love the Lord their God with all that they are. And you, you look at these commands, these words that God spoke to Israel. He was defining them as a people. These are my people. And this command is how they will act. For them to obey that is to simply be the people of God. Jesus has given us commands also. In fact... Uh, Matthew 28, the Great Commission. We're supposed to go baptizing 
making disciples and teaching them everything I have commanded you. Those commands are not a list by which Christians will be judged. They're a definition of how Christianity is going to play out in the real world. If you want to know, and Jesus tells us here, if you want to know what that statement is, if you want to know how to fill in this line, we are the people who love one another. That's the command that Jesus is giving here. So when he's here talking about, I've obeyed my father, so you should obey me, he's not saying, I have fit myself under the justice of God. He's saying, I have heard the command of the father, and I have lived that way. This is one of the main themes in the book of 1 John. If you claim to walk in the light, okay, that means you're going to be walking as he walked. This, this connection that we have with Christ means that we prioritize life the way he prioritizes things. We, we call things good that he calls good. We call things evil that he calls evil. We, we engage with people the way he engages with people. We are the people who love one another. That's why the Father is glorified in this. And that's why it proves that we are his disciples. In fact, Jesus taught them that himself. You will prove to be my disciples by your love for one another. Why? Because he as the king has set up the standard. This is how this culture is defined. Love for one another. If you live in love for one another, oh, that shows that you have Jesus as your king. Okay, That's obeying his command. When you see that command being obeyed, you know what that's called? It's called fruit. That's called fruit. And so here in this, in this second section, this is verses 7 through 11, we see Jesus saying, God wants this in you. And his word makes it happen in you. It prunes you. Right? So picture pruning. Um, go back to the Old Testament. Let's say, I just love taking Friday off. But the command of the Lord said the seventh day. You take the seventh day off. Not the sixth day. You take the seventh day off. Okay. My desire to take the, the, the Friday off gets pruned off. And it leaves room for a new view. Okay? We, we, we come to this situation in our lives going, I've got priorities in this life. I've, I, I need to make as much money as I can. Okay? I, I need to get everybody around me to think I'm a great person. I, I need to, whatever that is, and the word comes in and says, that's all nothing. We're going to prune that off out of your heart. And when that happens, do you know what you're prepared for? Fruit. I would rather do this other thing on Saturday morning. But the word says that I love one another and sacrifice. Boom. So what ends up happening? A dozen or more men show up together and they do firewood together as an expression of love for the community. Right? That, and some ladies. Um, and thank you to the ladies. I heard there were three. Awesome way to represent. Check this out. Every one of those was an act of love. That act of love is not finished. There are people in this community who are going to need firewood over the wintertime. We're going to need some people to hand out that firewood. We're going to need some people who are willing to go knock on a door and say, you gave us a phone call for some firewood. And they're like, put it over in the barn. You're like, I will, but I want to share the gospel with you. And some cookies. And, and I want to hear what's going on in your life. And, and I see that there's this other thing. I want to engage with you on a love level. Okay? This second step where we're actually praying for that is a premeditated love. Premeditated. I know this thing is coming up. I'm going to pray that God's going to work it out. What we're looking for is a new attitude. So the first issue is a new awareness of our union with God. Second one is a new attitude about that awareness. We're going to start seeing the situations in our lives as opportunity to bear fruit. Seeking to be cooperative in this. You're being creative even. We have an opportunity to be creative, which is a gift of God, in loving those people that God loves, 
which is a gift of God. And even just seeing that fruit being born brings joy in our lives. Another gift of God. God wants to see this happen in our lives. Verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. That is a sweet thing. But it moves us on to verses 12 through 17. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Remember, commandment, not standard by which you'll be judged, but definition of who you will be. We are the people who love. And then he describes that love. Verse 13, greater love is no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Ooh, it's sacrificial love. Verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Are you catching this? We went from a productive union to a cooperative union to a relational union? How often does a king take his subjects into his inner courtroom and share his heart with them? He, he, he gives them their structural commands for how life is supposed to look, but this king brings us right in. He, he discloses himself Self-disclosure is, is, is what love is all about. For, for a husband to not tell his wife his fears and joys and, and worries and excitements and plans, he's not expressing a relational love with her. But for him to start doing that, he makes himself vulnerable to her, her and she shares that with him. That's a, that's a personal relationship right there. That's... That's the kind of love that Jesus has with those who are abiding in him. It's not just about fruit production or even cooperative fruit production. He's, he's inviting us in as friends to share in this experience. And he shows them what that looks like. Verse 15, no longer do I call you servants for the servant doesn't know what the master's doing. I've called you friends for all that I've heard from the father I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. That, that showed up again. We're all of a sudden now praying for it. Only now, it's not praying to some maybe disconnected God who wants what I want. It's a personal Father who wants what I want. I got to tell you, having teenagers in the house is fun because we engage in the same projects together. Yesterday, I got to even delegate. I wasn't able to come to the firewood thing, but I sent some of my teenagers to it. Okay, Because we're of the same mind and seeking the same desires, we shared in that. I got to hear about how things went. I was on my own little project, and I got to share how our things went. And that's a, that's a sweet time. But it becomes this thing that the Puritans called their new affections. Affections are not just emotions. Uh, affections are this, this heart level, all of life encompassing passion and zeal to love God and, and follow and obey Him. It's not just emotions, though emotions are definitely involved. These, these new affections, they, they stir in us and they motivate us and so we willingly engage. You, you see this sometimes in like the Marines. They're not just marching. They're passionate to get out there. You see this on a football team. They're not just going out to do what the coach has told them to do. They're passionate to get out there. Right? This is not just the work crew going and doing their thing. They're, they're passionate to get out there. They're excited about it. They understand the plan. And they understand the outcome. And they understand where all this is coming from. They're affectionate to do it. So that third application is build practices in your life that actually stir those affections. Now, for, for those of you who have listened to Matt Chandler, he loves to use that. Do things that stir your affections for Christ. That's good. I'm actually talking about stirring your affections for bearing fruit. Because there's a couple of things that are going to work together here. All believers abide. Okay? Okay. But the word prunes us and it causes us to desire the fruit. We begin to participate in it. The word makes that happen. Okay? And this third statement here, the word continues to prune us and reveal in us the beauty of the abiding relationship. 
Is there, are there things in your life that you can do to remind yourself of that? You can put a picture on the fridge. I've, I've got this family, and I know they've got this situation, and I've got a plan. And I know that God wants to love them through this plan. And on this date, and on this time, I'm going to do that thing, and there's that picture. And it's that constant reminder, I've got things to do. Because God wants to love them through me. Okay, that could be a missionary. That could be a number of those things. And yet I want to draw you back to verse 17. These things I command you so that. You see that word so that. Jesus has a very specific thing in mind here. This is John. He's running around in circles. Vineyard, this is how it works. You're abiding and you abide more and you're bearing fruit. Here we go again. And he finally burrows his way down to the main point. What is the main point of the abiding section? It's defined by the so that. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Now, should we love our enemies? Yes. Should we have love for brothers around the world? Yes. Do you know what the specific, explicit context of this is? Look to your left and your right and you'll see what this specific context is. The people in this church, as we love one another, that's what he's aiming at here. As we love one another, the picture on your fridge should be out of our church directory. You catch that? It should be out of our church directory. The people that you've been put here by God to be with is, is the atmosphere in which our fruit is born. We bear fruit of love toward one another. So a couple of questions. Do you know the people in this building well enough to know how to love them well? That should be super convicting for every one of us. Okay. Second, do you know them well enough and yet you... I don't know how to do it. I don't know what I should this and when and... Uh, and maybe, maybe a third one, maybe you've come to the point of saying, I've tried in the past and I've just been injured. Okay? A couple of points I want to make there. Jesus expressed love for you by dying for you. We can probably engage again. Even, even if I've been injured in the past, I can engage again. Even if you've been injured in the past, you can engage again. Christ engaged and gave his life. And I know that's hard, but you can and, and joy is at the end of that road. The love of God is at the end of that road. Right? If you're wondering what you're supposed to do, guess what? You should start asking questions and praying. Right? But I want to come down to this main issue, and it's the one that we started with. If you are a believer, you are abiding in Christ. And if you are abiding, you are bearing fruit. And I know that there's some people here going, I, I'm a Christian and I don't really know what life is like. I don't know. If, uh, you, you could ask them, well, what are you doing? And they would have no answer. And, they, and yet you're watching their life and they're caring for their family. They're, they're, they're showing up early maybe to church. Or, or maybe they're praying for people. You, you might find that God is, is actually building fruit in your life already and you haven't recognized it. That is an opportunity to thank God. He's already bearing fruit in your life. That is a beautiful, beautiful thing. But look at that. You can engage more. Not that you abide more. We're not talking about abiding more. We're talking about building a new awareness of that abiding. Building a new attitude about that abiding. And building new affections for that abiding. Because the fruit is a beautiful thing. Let's pray. Lord, you are an amazing vine dresser. You are a beautiful and loving and perfect king who gives us the commands that we can bear fruit in. Um, and what a wonderful command to love. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us, that you would build within us a desire and an affection for others around us. And even though maybe we've gotten in the habit of not loving those that are around us, Lord, may you break us out of that habit. 
giving us the opportunity and the motivation to love and love well. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.